The film industry has embraced horror almost since its beginnings. The moving image is ideally suited to evoke the chills and thrills inherent in the genre, and over time, horror has reinvented itself so that it continues to compel new audiences long after monsters and maniacs and demons lose their fright value over subsequent generations. Many horror properties have resonated so intensely that they've spawned long-running film franchises that have released new films over and over again, some going on for decades, and others rebooting for yet another scare. Now the great pop culture debate wants to look back at these fright factors as we determine the best horror franchise of all time. Somebody call Father Karras. I got the demons running all through me. Hope you like pea soup. I'm your host, Eric Resniak. Please help me welcome my screamed panel for this episode. I can see her dirty pillows. Please welcome back Kate Reculia. They're breasts, mama. <laughs> that reminds me, everyone. <laughs> Make sure to cast your vote for prom queen. And we are lucky enough to have not one but two extra special guest panelists for this episode. She's a loving daughter, slow zombie slayer, and not the one for anything else supernatural. Welcome screenwriter, filmmaker, and all-around badass, Kelly Terrell. Hi, everyone. And I also just want to say I only fuck with slow zombies. These fast zombies are just a mess. It's unrealistic, and we'll never get through the genre alive. The fast ones. There you go. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Finally, the call is coming from inside the house, and her favorite scary movie is all of them. It's alternative drag legend Peaches Christ. Oh, hi. I am thrilled to be here, and I wish I lived in a house. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, can, thank- I can only afford an apartment. Yeah, same here in New York. So to find out how we came up with our bracket and how we went from the top 32 to the scary 16, become a Patreon supporter of our show or check out the bonus episode we released earlier this week to walk you through our decisions thus far. In the meantime, let's take a stab and move right on to these debates. First up in round two, the majority of the panel thinks that Freddy and ultimate number one seed, A Nightmare on Elm Street, is still coming for you. But Peaches is a murderous Toys R Us kid and prefers five seed child's play. Peaches, explain why we should keep playing with Chucky into round three. I'll strip in my claws and explain why we shouldn't sleep on Elm Street. Peaches, do you mind going first? Not at all. And I think anyone who knows me or is a fan of Peaches or knows me personally, especially my family, I- I- I'm here to tell you I was the most obsessed. I, I win all <laughs> trophies and prizes for being the biggest Freddy Krueger fan from 1984 on. I was and still am obsessed with Freddy Krueger and A Nightmare on Elm Street. And A Nightmare on Elm Street is probably tied with Texas Chainsaw Massacre as the most pivotal, important movie of for me. So with all that being said, I'm stepping outside of myself and looking at the power of a franchise. <laughs> now, maybe I am so emotionally invested in Freddy Krueger that there was a point where that franchise betrayed its fans and Freddie went too far and it became stupid. And I was upset and hurt like a jilted lover. And, you know, there was a point where the camp ble- <laughs> this is coming from me. So take it, you know, <laughs> the camp was too much. The sass was stupid. It just got silly, silly, silly child's play. I feel like with Chucky, this is a genre bending franchise that has explored styles, tones, territories, reinvented itself successfully again and again and again. Chucky has endured. Chucky has stayed true to who Chucky was at the beginning. Chucky has not changed. And yet he's been able to appear in uh, a serious, straightforward horror franchise like the first three films. But then switch gears and do the cramp camp <laughs> camp, the, do the camp fantasy, you know, films uh, Bride of Chucky and Seed of Chucky and then switch gears again with Cult of Chucky and Curse of Chucky uh, and now with this genius TV show. So as much as it kills me, Freddie, I got to give it to Child's Play. That is such a great argument. And I will say um, I'm the one defending Nightmare on Elm Street and I'm, I'm- almost ready to be flipped right now based on the argument. But let me speak a little bit why I think that Nightmare should at least be considered. So in my opinion, of all the horror slashers, Freddy is the most compelling. He's the most terrifying character. Those claws, the scarred face, the fact that he can kill you in your dreams. He's a brilliant horror creation and an iconic pop culture character. Freddy also single clawedly is responsible for New Line Cinema's <laughs> output as a studio in the 80s and 90s. The franchise is the third highest grossing horror franchise in history, grossing nearly $800 million in inflation-adjusted dollars. 
There have been nine Nightmare on Elm Street movies, five over the course of the first 10 years, a crossover film in which he was pitted against Friday the 13th, Jason Voorhees, and then a 2010 reboot that landed with a deafening thud. We'll talk a lot about the law of diminishing returns this episode, as many of these franchises had sequels that diluted the original concept. I think that's especially true for Elm Street, and I think Peach is alluding to that in part because the first film was so good. It was shocking. It was exciting. It was inventive. And it was very, very scary. And what came after it often failed to live up to the original. Although I love the queer allegory of the second film. Another reboot is allegedly in the works, but the rights have reverted back to the West Craven estate. And I don't think we know exactly where that's going to end up. With that being said, I'm going to put it to votes. Kate, where are you on this one? Peach has made an unbelievable argument. Um, and I don't know if it's because like I'm feeling contrarian because, like, of, I, of course I picked Nightmare on Elm Street. It's just, like, a juggernaut in terms of, like, horror franchise. But, like, Child's Play, Chucky keeps getting better as the franchise has gone. And that is exceptional. Um, I'm going to be a contrarian, and I'm going to flip to Child's Play. Kelly, where are you voting? <laughs> okay, so I'm not flipping. But I will say that Peaches gave a really good uh, argument. Mm-hmm. And I really, really enjoy the series. Like, it's really, really good. And I didn't think I was going to like it. And it's queer, and I love that. But... Were there any black people in any of the mm. uh, Child's Play movies? Hmm. Okay. Now, granted, we all died in Freddy. And I had glasses. And when that aunt girl with the asthma and her... Fa- oh, I was like, uh. I don't want that happening to me. But I loved it. And there were black people. So as I said before, I'm rooting for everyone black. So it's going to be <laughs> Freddy... Um, Peaches almost weed me because I think there's an argument to be made that um, Child's Play is like the homicidal hair or, or the tortoise versus the homicidal hair in this particular mm-hmm. right, right? Mm-hmm. Like they've been slow and steady, but they haven't needed a reboot. They have they've just reinvented themselves organically. Um, I just think that the power that Nightmare on Elm Street has as a franchise, I have to give it for the strength of the property. I think a good new Nightmare on Elm Street entry can totally bring that shit back around. And it should because there's fertile land there. Peaches, were you going to say something? Just that 50 Cent was uh, the star of Seed of Chucky. Oh. So I, I just had to, you know, just, <laughs> just had to say, but but I will say that I, I really had to um, reach the depths of my mind, which, you know, <laughs> I, admittedly is problematic. Kelly, I'm so glad that you bring this up because it actually made me think of something that I hadn't really thought of before. And that is that in Dream Warriors, Kincaid is Mm -hmm. one of the surviving Dream Warriors. And Mm -hmm. um, I hate what they did to the surviving Dream Warriors and Dream Master. But Mm -hmm. but to have Kincaid actually be one of the survivors was... I mean, it sucks to say, but it was at the time pretty progressive. You know, uh, so fucked up Mm -hmm. to even admit that. But, you know... There were very few, well. We know that that's the whole joke and the whole trope. Like, black folks didn't survive slasher films, but Kincaid did. I think that going back, you know, as queer people, as black people who love horror, these places where we saw ourselves represented, um, they're important to acknowledge. I think that um, Kincaid, I forget his name, the actor. Oh fuck, I forget. But anyway, I saw him talk once at a co- conference or convention. He talked about how it was debated whether or not he could hug Heather Langenkamp and Patricia Arquette in that whole final moment. That was a discussion. And that is that was the 80s, you know, like, Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, the 80s was wild. So it's like on one hand, we have all of these goddamn hellraisers. Yeah. And then we have like this conversation of like, can I can I hug her? What? Wild. 80s are wild. (laughs) Wild. They are. And if you want, we uh, that was discussed in part one when we talk about Hellraiser, but we'll be talking about that more in a little bit. I believe we are currently deadlocked two to two. Uh, Nightmare on Elm Street is the ultimate number one seed. It is the one that got the most votes in the poll. So I am afraid I'm going to push it forward. Peaches, you did an amazing job uh, stumping for Child's Play. Um, it's just a seed thing. Next, the majority of the panel wants horror history to the future, supporting three seed universal monster films. But Kelly thinks two seed Gremlins is the gift that keeps on giving. Kelly, feed us some hot takes on Gremlins. While <laughs> I do the time warp back to the early 1900s in favor of universal monsters, Kelly, why don't you go first? I mean, I already know I'm going to lose. It's like, is it even worth it? I just like little fur (laughs) shit. That's really it. Like, I was scared. (laughs) I was just scared as a kid. I thought that shit was amazing. That little Zach boy. Mm -hmm. Cute. I don't, and he got and he got sexier. I feel like I saw mm-hmm. him in something, and he had like he's in waxwork. He's in waxwork, mm, and he <laughs> can good. wax on and wax off, baby. <laughs> let me tell you. Uh, 
Yeah, I'm not. I'm not giving a dissertation on Gremlins. It's fine. I will say, I'm not sure that, that, that we are going to win because I know for a fact that uh, Peaches is like, I'm not sure the Universal Monsters count as a franchise. Oh, right. Th- that's an, an issue for me. Um, but I'll say that really my main argument for the Universal Monsters is primacy, right? They were the first. The, these were the first horror films made. They are in many ways still the iconic depictions of some of these characters. You have your Bela Lugosi as Dracula. Your Boris Karloff as Frankenstein's monster in The Mummy. Claude Rains as the Invisible man etc etc are these films going to stack up to others in the scare factor on this list absolutely not at the time they were thrilling but now it's they're quaint right i would say but i think from a legacy standpoint that's why i picked them over gremlins i think there were other uh, entries in round one that absolutely i would pick over universal monsters here that have already gone out but um peaches where are you on this Well, like you mentioned, you already heard from me um, earlier that I question whether or not Universal Monsters is is a franchise. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you did say that they're interlinked. And I actually started to think after you said that, like, oh, that's true. But they're not really. Like, they they sort of – it's kind of like they're interlinked when when it's convenient. I guess that's Mm -hmm. what the, the, you know, comic book superhero movies do nowadays. Um, so I actually am going to sort of stick with that. I love it. If you had put Creature from the Black Lagoon up against Gremlins, I would have voted for Creature. Because mm. um, I think of it as just such a masterpiece. And and actually the sequel is quite good. And, you know, anyway. But I'm going to vote for Gremlins because I think, you know, oh. it, 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 it <laughs> is a bona fide franchise. All right. Kate, where are you? Hmm. I think this is a case where I am also going to vote for the actual like continuation IP of Gremlins. All right. So, Kelly, there you go. Gremlins is actually. I didn't even have to fucking try. I was like, (laughs) I don't even care about them. (laughs) Congratulations. We love it. All right. So we will advance Gremlins into round three. Next, it's a unanimous victory for one seed Halloween, which ate up four seed Hannibal Lecter and left no crumbs, not even a toenail. The panel is evenly split between three seed Living Dead and two seed Scream. Kate, explain why the legions of the undead are scary enough to shamble into round three. Peaches, forget motives. It's the 21st century. Who needs a motive? And just push for Scream to make it to the Elite Eight. Peaches, will you go first, please? I'm defending Scream. You're defending Scream. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to guess Peaches is not, in fact, defending Scream. (laughs) I'm defending Scream against Halloween. Uh, no, against the Living Dead. Oh God, I'm a mess. Okay. I mean, if you if you want to defend the Living Dead against Scream, I would switch. I would swip. Blah, or We're not doing would that. Swap arguments. Uh, okay. What? We're not doing that. No, no, no. <laughs> I think well, between between the Living Dead and Scream, I think probably it's hard to say, but I might. Uh, it's very very close for me, and I guess in a moment of weakness, I chose Scream. Um, <laughs> yeah, because now I'm like. Really? I, but I, <laughs> I kind of remember what I was thinking. Um, mm-hmm. Partly it was that I think Wes Craven in many, many, many ways doesn't get the sort of dues that he deserves as a sort of a master of horror. And I think that, you know, his early independent films like Hills Have Eyes and Last House on the Left, of course, are extraordinary. His... Uh, uh, creation of a nightmare on elm street obviously built new line cinema and reinvented horror once again i mean just when you thought or at least as someone who was born in the 70s and and my heyday in horror is the 80s you know the fangoria obsessed kid and and by the 90s thought that horror would really ha- had seen its best days then came along scream and scream gave us meta horror which honestly is an unbelievable contribution to our genre in so many ways. I think it's why we're sitting here today having this debate. So I think the reason I chose scream is because of what it did for the whole genre. And then, you know, of course the sequels come out and they're successful and we're still seeing them as, as successful sequels. And, and, you know, now we're in this, what what do they call it? The legacy, you know, films where, where we've got scream doing that successfully. So, I think Living Dead is unreal, and and I could actually argue against myself right now. But I know that when I chose this, my mind was all about Wes Craven and and how he kind of reinvented the genre multiple times, and Scream is a huge contribution to that. Excellent. Kate, talk to us about Living Dead. These movies are the greatest franchise, 
partially because of how they completely reinvented and created its own kind of zombie movie in the 60s, uh, partially because they are incredibly in- incredible independent films that like changed the way independent horror was made uh, because of like in the first one, a black main character who is like, I think it was the first black main character in a horror movie. Is this correct? I feel like this is correct. I feel like I read that in my in my research. Unbelievable. Like You're correct. <laughs> I'm correct. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and Kelly had an incredible argument for The Living Dead in the previous one and I feel like she's going to get to talk about it at a at a previous at a next a next round of this. Um every one of those movies George Romero is pushing himself as kind of reinventing what a horror movie can actually talk about in addition to people biting each other, right? Like, and uh, Dawn of the Dead, uh, wow, why do they come to this mall? It, they they knew it in life. They keep coming in death, commercialism. Uh, Day of the Dead, like, what is the military industrial complex? What have we done for ourselves? Like, oh my God, like, it, it, they're just so, and they're fun. They're fun. Uh, so my partner was, was uh, when I was telling him, was like, obviously it's Living Dead movies. He's like, oh, obviously it's the Alien movies. And he's like, the Living Dead movies are not scary. And I was like, but they're kind of haunting in a soul way. And they're entertaining. And they're thoughtful. And the gore, Tom Savini is fucking genius, like is off the charts. Uh, Living Dead movies all the way. Okay, great. Kelly, where are you on this one? Uh, I already have it all all the way. So, I mean, like, let's just come on. I literally, in my intro, was Zombie Slayer. That's true. Uh, you That's know, true. it wasn't Scream Slayer. You know, like, uh, here's the thing. I am a zombie. The first film I ever made was, like, a black lesbian zombie film where they were literally trapped in a laundry room. And they had to, like, they only had, like, maybe, like, 10 minutes left. And they had to, like, hash out all the shit that was wrong in their marriage before the fucking zombies came in. And that was only, I know, such a mess. None of the shots matched. Like, none of it was horrible. But the, but the, but the actresses were really good. And I have to say that, like, there's something about the zombie genre that, that comes from Night of the Living Dead that I think really shows that this isn't just about the monsters. It shows Mm -hmm. about who we become when the monsters come. And I think um, it's, it's, it's really smart and no, no. And I think scream is really smart too. It's not saying anything other than like, these white people are crazy. (laughs) And like, and like, and like, like stop fucking married man girl. Cause this is how, I mean, it's another, it's another example of like thirsty women who are doing crazy things. And now the whole town is fucked up and can't sleep at night because you couldn't not fuck that man's mom or dad. And here we go. So <laughs> like right. none of this would have happened if people weren't having affairs. So it's, it's not a living dead for me. Yeah. Living. Dead. All right. Um, I will throw a vote for scream just in the sake of, I, I, I want to give it at least a vote before it goes out, but uh, you've all done a great job. We will advance living dead into round three. Next. The panel is split between four seed poltergeist and one seed evil dead beaches. Summon your army of darkness and push ash into round three. I will try to bring Carol Ann toward the light, or am I supposed to go away from the light? I can never keep that straight and score some points for poltergeist. Poltergeist. I'll go first. Poltergeist. Poltergeist. <laughs> So uh, I don't intend to win this one, but there are a total of four Poltergeist films currently in consideration, the three original and the reboot from 2015. For my purposes here, I'm focusing primarily on the original three. Those films are incredibly effective. It's a haunted house movie, essentially. But in my mind, it's so much scarier than any other haunted house movie I've ever watched. Again, I saw these movies way before I probably should have, like, very young and there are moments that are indelibly sealed into my brain from these there's a scene where the father is drinking from a tequila (laughs) bottle he drinks the worm he then throws up the worm and it turns into a giant worm man i refused to drink out of bottles for years because of that scene (laughs) there's a scene where hands come out of rain puddles in a parking garage i avoided puddles for years after that the freezing pool sequence in three the skeleton pool sequence in one terrifying also don't make pool but um (laughs) bottom line for me is this there is no question that as a franchise this one doesn't have the legs of some of the other ones on this list it just doesn't and i think the reboot from the mid 2010s 
was broad strokes just a retelling of the original and didn't really do much else with it. Um, there are good bones in this haunted house. I think they just need to relocate the body somewhere else to kind of beat that metaphor into the ground. Peaches, take it away and talk to us about okay, it. Okay, before I talk to you about Evil Dead, I think part of a good debate is sort of to just shut down a little bit of what you just said because – Yes, the 1984 <laughs> film Poltergeist is perhaps one of the best movies ever made. I love it so much. I was such a dork as a kid that I recorded the entire film on a tape cassette and would listen to it on the bus on a walk band to and from school because I was such a horror kid. And I know every line That's of that amazing. movie. The sequels are not good. And I, I just have to <laughs> say, like, they're fine. You know, they're flash and trash. But the, uh, the magic of that first movie is just unparalleled. And, and what I would argue, you know, based on that is we're looking at franchises and the strength of franchises. Yep. And so mm -hmm. The Evil Dead, the world of The Evil Dead, the first film being one of the great indie horror films. You know, the, these guys who, of course, went on to be important, huge filmmakers, um, made this movie for almost no money. Right. And, and it was successful enough that it, that it allowed them to basically remake it as a comedy. You know, and Evil Dead 2 mm -hmm. is essentially a, a, a remake, which is really actually quite genius in a lot of ways. Um, mm -hmm. Let's go back and make the movie the way we wanted to make it, you know, using the money we made for the first one. And then they take us to the medieval army of darkness and, you know, it goes on to um, eventually have a TV series, you know, Ash versus Evil Dead. So as a franchise, the, the, as much as it kills me to say so, because I actually prefer the movie Poltergeist almost over anything, but as a franchise, mm -hmm. it has to be Evil Dead. Kate, where are you on this? I agree. Poltergeist is one of my favorite movies of all time. It's amazing. And I feel like I just recently saw Poltergeist 3 and it's haunting because of what happened to mm. um, Heather O'Rourke. Mm -hmm. But there's some really fantastic practical effects in that movie that are really interesting. Uh, uh, all that to say, I completely agree. Evil Dead as a franchise. Yep. Kelly. Now, you know, in the last, before we got to this, I had Blade Bitch up against mm -hmm. Poltergeist. <laughs> And I said, Blade actually is not good. So then mm -hmm. I said, Evil Dead. And it's so funny because in my notes, I said, uh, it's all okay because none of these are going to beat Poltergeist anyway. <laughs> so it's okay that I switched. <laughs> like, girl, it'll be fine. Don't worry. <laughs> and I have to say, I'm a flippity. What did Beyonce say? Flippy, flippy, up, flippy, up, bitch. Woo! Like, yeah, I flipped. <laughs> she did not say that. She said flippity flop something else. But when we and I think but what I said before was kind of like Bruce Campbell is such mm -hmm. a delight and such a wonderful horror character that doesn't yep. lose any of the thrill and the humor. And, you know, like we said before, the misogyny and all of that stuff. And mm -hmm. I think that like the fact that this movie like a new one just came mm -hmm. out. Right. And mm -hmm. like. It's, and it's so good, right? And gross. And you know, it's really funny. I actually took a like a Pilates class or a bar class with the girl that stars in there. And she was so nice. <laughs> so nice. <laughs> anyway, I was like, because she was an episode of SVU. And I was like, oh, weren't you in this episode of SVU? And she's like, you saw it. And I'm like, you were so good. Anyway, um, she was really nice. <laughs> um, but I say this to say that like, there is a longevity, I think, um, the fact that it's been so long between the first one and the last one. And there's a TV show. And it just gives a robust way so i have to, i have poltergeist on here and um i'm flipping great so we will advance evil dead into round three next it's a toss-up between two seed the conjuring universe and three seed hellraiser kelly explain why you will have none of our disrespect to the conjuring kate put a pin in the chances of the cenobites by pushing for hellraiser i'll have kelly go first <clears throat> okay so what everyone else missed before this was how much I hate Hellraiser because the <laughs> lady. So like, this is the thing. Sometimes it's not even the movie that you're supposed to defend. It's just the fact that yep. you hate the other one. So this Absolutely. is one of them. And like what I said before was this, is it like when, uh, like looking back at the film as like an adult, uh, she was a pick me girl. Why are you killing all these people for this man who literally looks like death incarnate who lit like all this shit? You got pinhead. You got all this for some dick girl. What are you doing? <laughs> like you're literally like like you're like people are coming to visit you and you're just like killing them in your house. And like <laughs> so that you can like get some head girl. What are you stand up? So it's a no for me. And Hellraiser is just really weird. Uh, 
Conjuring, I feel like there's only one really good Conjuring film, but I think there's something about the universe. I think there's something about the amount of money it is made. And I don't feel like it's, uh, I don't feel like it's dying down. I just feel it's strong. And Annabelle, that bitch. Yeah, it's Conjuring. <laughs> Kate, talk to us about Hellraiser. So uh, Hellraiser as a movie, it feels like like a like a like a transmission from another dimension, hell, right? Which is kind of the whole point of Hellraiser, right? Is that it feels absolutely freaky, transformative, like blow the top off your head, like the effects, especially in the first one. I've actually only ever seen the first Hellraiser, and the it's so gross and so creative and so specifically the vision of Clive Barker, which I think it's also the first movie he directed. Um, and like, like Nightbreed, the director's cut of that feels like a more like kind of also like complete vision of what Clive Barker was trying to do. Uh, but like Hellraiser is just like a bolt from the blue that like changed. I think it's also independent changed like horror fantasy um, in a way that is really interesting. And I, and like people just like are in deep on Hellraiser and I respect that. I'm, I'm, I'm either one of these I could vote for though. So I'm, I'm changeable. <laughs> All right. Peaches, where are you? Well, on you know, I, I, as I acknowledged in the earlier um, discussion and debate, uh, I hadn't really considered with the conjuring all of the offshoots of the nun and the, uh, and, and Annabelle and, and actually how brilliant that all is. And as much as I absolutely mm-hmm. think Hellraiser and Hellbound are quintessential horror classics and and you know especially as someone who talks so much about queer horror you know Clive Barker's contribution to sort of the the bizarre queer SM sort of mm-hmm. uh world of horror is just so huge um as a franchise Hellraiser is kind of a hot mess as it as it moves along mm-hmm. and um but I did really enjoy the Hellraiser reboot. However, I've been persuaded by the mm-hmm. conjuring argument of this, this mm-hmm. world. I think maybe I have to vote for conjuring. Okay. Uh, so that actually would give us, even if I continued with Hellraiser, it would be split two and two and uh, conjuring is a two seed. So it would advance. Woo! Look at so, that. And I, I, I will say that Kelly made the great point that conjuring universe right now is at its peak and it has been peaking for quite some time now. And it doesn't really show any signs of slowing. Even if the films are not always great, they've got a self perpetuating engine going on right now. Mm-hmm. And in horror, that's actually not that hard to, or not that easy to sustain. So um, yeah, I think it, it makes a lot of sense for conjuring universe to continue. And it will go on to round three next in an unlikely matchup. It's one seed alien up against five seed Texas chainsaw massacre <laughs> peaches put on a happy face or really anyone else's face and stump for chainsaw. I will explain how in space, nobody can hear you scream. And that's why alien deserves a spot in round three. I'll go first. Um, internally here at the great pop culture debate, we debated whether alien uh, actually fit this topic. Is it a horror movie? Sure. But it's also a sci-fi movie. And there's an argument that while the first film is horror, the subsequent films are not, they are sci-fi action thrillers. I could maybe almost sort of buy that line of thinking, except for the fact that the xenomorph is such a terrifying creation in virtually any of its incarnations that is still unquestionably a horror film to me. They reproduce via spawn that cling to your face, asphyxiate you with the tail around your throat so they can deposit their eggs inside of you. You gestate them, they burst forth of your still living cavity. What? Their blood is acid. They have a piston with teeth for a tongue. How is that not horror? As a franchise, Alien has a somewhat different path than many of the other properties on here. One and two are seen as high watermarks for film, period. Three is controversial, arguably a victim of studio meddling more than anything else. Resurrection did not fare well, but I personally enjoyed Prometheus. There's a new spinoff coming to TV. We will see if Alien ends up on the big screen or not, or if this franchise is just as dead as the gunner on that abandoned ship. With that being said, Peaches, talk to us about uh, Texas Chainsaw. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre is hands down, I think, one of the most important you know horror films ever made. I think it reinvented the genre of horror. Uh, I think it did what few films um, get the the sort of the opportunity to do, which is to take sort of a a simple concept, a a simple um, story, and then make it and turn it into something that is filmed so extraordinarily that it has endured the test of time. And that film in many ways showed people much like psycho, how a horror film could be made. Um, You know, we think of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre as being incredibly gory. Well, they didn't have the special effects for that film. So you see things like a director having a, a terrifying leather face, lift a woman 
turn her around. You see a meat hook. Well, we, our brains do the math. We don't see anything more, but we think we did. Genius filmmaking. And then for the same director to come back and reinvent his own movie in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, to make it 80s, to make it a comedy, to put a new spin on it, to make it fantastic, just to make it over the top, just brilliant. But unlike uh, Hellraiser, or um, sort of some of the other franchises where the first two, I think, start strong and then everything kind of falls apart. Hellraiser, or sorry, Texas Chainsaw is all over the map. You get this whole uh, franchise that has good entries and bad entries. The reboot is good. The bad entries, I think, are interesting failures, even if they're not totally successful. Even the latest, you know, Netflix streaming version of it, which came out last year, uh, was hotly debated amongst horror fans. And um, as much as I love Alien, and I do, I think Alien is an incredible vo- movie, and I definitely think it's horror. I think the, the the impact that the Texas Chainsaw Massacre has had on the world of horror, the impact that the icon Leatherface has had, um, just, you know, it blows the xenomorph out of space. All right. Kelly, where are you on this one? God, I always sound like a blubbering four-year-old. I'm like, I don't know. I just, who's cuter? Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, Leatherface I mean, is gay. Yeah, I mean, I think I uh, see. I don't have any of these like going anywhere on my bracket, so it's just like um, I'm going to like. I just have to think about it. Wait, what are we doing? Aliens? We're doing or- aliens, aliens versus Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Oh fuck! Okay, um, Texas. Okay, but also Kate. fuck Texas. <laughs> but Texas. <laughs> Kate, I'm gonna go alien here, uh-uh. uh, which I. Uh, I'm doing it because it is really the only franchise on here that is haunted house franchise. You have a haunted uh, spaceship. You have a haunted terraform base. You have a haunted uh, prison. And then you have a haunted. I don't really remember resurrection. <laughs> what do you say? Poltergeist? I mean, poltergeist haunted house. Oh, sorry. You're right. It is. Yeah. Well, that takes away my. Uh, also, the Xenomorphs uh, aren't ghosts. haunted house. No, but they're just it's fucking like, terrifying. They're just terrifying. Yeah, I I think bec- the sheer terror of and and I don't know. I'm just re- I'm just saying Alien to be contrarian, I suppose, because like I haven't seen the Texas Chainsaw Massacre because in fact I am too afraid to watch it. So maybe there's that, <laughs> which I think is a point in the Texas Chainsaw yep. Massacre's column. Yep. I will say in order to keep Texas Chainsaw going, because I do think it is the correct victor here, I would switch my vote to Texas Chainsaw to make sure that it progresses. So Okay, okay, that's fair, that's fair. <laughs> all right, we've swapped votes. Texas Chainsaw will continue into round three. Finally, in round two, it's another unanimous victory, this time for Two Seed Friday the 13th, which proved unlucky indeed for Three Seed Psycho. And that's the end of round two. We're going to take a quick break and investigate that strange noise we heard from the basement. We'll be right back after these messages. Hey listeners, it's Bob from the Great Pop Culture Debate. We hope you're enjoying this episode and that you're yelling back at your speakers telling us how wrong we are. Did you know that there's a much better way to tell us how you feel? Come kiki with our panelists on Discord. Our patrons at the $10 level get access to our exclusive Discord server, where you can share your thoughts about our decisions or or just gab with our group about everything pop culture. It's like participating in your own episode of RuPaul's Drag Race Untucked. We have something for everyone to talk about, including reality TV, comics, news, nostalgia, and so much more. So if you love Spirited Debate and fabulous people, become a Patreon supporter today and join in on the conversation. And we are back for round three of our best horror franchise debate, Boo! Before we get into the Elite Eight, I wanted our panelists to share their socials, as well as what other projects they're working on. Kate, where can people find you and what else are you doing? Uh, you can find me on Instagram if you like cat pictures at Gomez Rack. Um, and my last two books, uh, Tuesday Mooney Talks to Ghosts and Bellwether Rhapsody, are both kind of horror inspired. Um, and you can find them at any fine bookseller. Great. Thank you very much. Kelly, where can people find you and what else are you working on? Okay, so you can hit me up. I'm a Twitter girl. Oh, mm-hmm. it's, it's not even called fucking Twitter anymore. It's just called X. X. Anyway, I'm going to yeah. call it. I'm going to call it Twitter because that's. That's the that's Jesus that's Jesus gave it that name so I'm just gonna call it Twitter. Uh, it's you're gonna like you're never inviting me back. Um, so it's, no. it's Kelly K E L L E E N is in Nicole T is in Tom. That's it. I almost said my email. You don't need to, you don't you don't need that. So that is my Twitter and my Instagram. And all I show on Instagram is my cat and oysters. 
That's it. So you're in good company with Kate. And what project are you working on? Um, Well, if you haven't already, uh, you can see uh, the Amazon Blumhouse film that I co-wrote called Run, Sweetheart, Run, which came out last October. You can uh, uh, watch it on Prime. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, we're in a strike, so we ain't did shit. Like, it's just waiting. (laughs) Mm. we're just waiting um there's lots of stuff that we're developing outside of studios of course because we are not scabs over up in here Mm -hmm. uh but there's lots of things horror horror related things black horror related things that we are working on and just cannot wait for the strike to be over for us to pitch and um, i'm really excited to share those things when they get greenlit when the strike is over so great that's about it i'm and listen, you are welcome anytime. We, we've we had such a great time with you. Mm-hmm. And when you those get approved, you come and let us know. And we'll let our, our listeners know about them as well. Peaches, how can people find you? And what are you working on? Uh, I, you can find me on Instagram at the Peaches Christ, And I'm on TikTok. I forget. I think Peaches Christ 666. And mm-hmm. um, I barely use TikTok. I'm terrible. Um, I, uh, yeah, I am on Facebook as well. And then I also have a... Uh, peacheschrist.com. <laughs> I'm a mess. Um, and I'm working on um, my, right now I'm really knee deep in my um, immersive horror show, which is kind of like a, an immersive theater um, experience mashed up with a haunted house. It's a 60 minute walkthrough um, show this year. It's called the initiation. Uh, we do it at my um, show called terror vault uh, where we have a, a vampire bar called the Fang Bang. Mm. Uh, it's all, it all happens at the San Francisco Mint Building. Uh, and that um, you can find out more about at terravault.com. I have a, a podcast called the Midnight Mass Podcast where we discuss all things cult movies. And I am trying to get money for a, a new horror movie. So um, we are uh, out there, you know, talking to investors. So we'll see. Exciting. And uh, is that all about evil or is that something that people can watch now? No, uh, so it's a new movie. All About Evil is a horror movie I made um, that actually you can watch on Shudder if you get Shudder or um, you could buy it on Blu-ray if you uh, visit the Severin website. Um, Severin handles it. So uh, this is a new movie that um, hopefully, you know, also the strike is affecting our ability to, you know, do anything. So you want to talk about horror, look at what the the, uh, film industry is doing to its talent. So seriously, Mm -hmm. but thank you again, Peaches. It's been such an honor to have you on our episode. We really do appreciate it. Uh, Thrilled to be here. Thank you. Uh, for me, you can find me at Eric Resniak on Twitter or X or whatever the fuck it's called currently uh, and Instagram. Or you can just message at Great Pop Culture Debate on Insta or at GPCD on Mastodon. Now let's move on to round three. Those eggs I found on that strange planet are starting to hatch. We're going to do round robin style eliminations here. First up, it's Nightmare on Elm Street, a one seed versus Gremlins, a two seed. Kate, where are you voting? I got to go with Freddy. Oh, my God. Nothing is more terrifying than a guy with, like, razors on his hands who makes jokes and kills you while you're asleep. Oh, my God. Talk to my boyfriend when I don't trim my fingernails often <laughs> enough. Um, <laughs> Kelly, where, right, Kelly, where are you? Um, one, two, Freddy's coming for you. He's got a theme song, ladies and gentlemen, right? It's a, it's a, got a funky beat and you can dance to it. Peaches, where he's, are you? He's got a theme song and he's got a Dawkins song. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. That's true. He has, he has so a amazing. fresh he has a fresh prince song. He he has an album. I have it on vinyl. Listen, it's called, he's, it's called like Freddie's Tunes or something. He's a multi he's a multi hyphenate, right? He, the, what a talent. Peaches he had where a one nine hundred number. He, he yeah, did. anyway, he did. <laughs> he did. Um, <laughs> of course, a nightmare on Elm Street wins, obviously. Yes, I, I will make it unanimous. A clean sweep for Nightmare on Elm Street, which will go on to our final four. Next, it's Halloween versus the Living Dead season. I'm going to start at the back of the pack. Peaches, mm-hmm. where are you? This is really, really tough. Yes, it's um, where it gets fun. It, it, but I, I, I'm, I'm looking at it again about the debate is about stronger or best franchises. And, yep. and while I would actually say that I prefer night of the living dead over Halloween as a movie, which is so hard to say, cause Halloween is one of the best, most brilliant films ever made. Um, I think for the franchise purposes, I go Halloween. Kelly, where are you on this one? It's, it's still living dead. Okay. Kate, where are you? Uh, so we haven't really talked about Halloween, we have not. which like, 
Halloween is, I remember watching Halloween for the first time in my freshman dorm, like in the like lounge area and my RA, like no one had, like I hadn't seen it. She hadn't seen it. But the part where Bob's body like drops down when she goes into the room and she just like, like tore the roof off the dorm with her scream. And and it was just like, I, I mean, cause I was a wimp and like I had watched scream with you and Bob drink, but like I hadn't really had much experience going to the movies to see a scary movie and reacting to a scary movie with people. And Halloween is a great movie for that. Halloween is also an incredibly suspenseful film. Mm-hmm. It has an unbelievable soundtrack, Jamie Lee queen, um, Michael Myers shape, Shatner mask, etc. Like there's just so much lore. Again, another independent horror movie just like coming out of nowhere and changing everything. Yeah. Um that said, I'm I'm dead all the way. All right, you're Forever. dead all the way. Forever. So we currently have two deads, one one uh Halloween. I go with Halloween here. And here's my argument from a uh movie to movie standpoint, <laughs> franchise to franchise. I think Halloween has some real duds in the mix. There's no some question. Real duds. I mean, there's the part where they just flat out move away from Michael Myers, and it's about the masks. And like that <laughs> might have been the first hollow. That may have been the first the Halloween movie. What was saw. that episode? What was that I, about? I, I and I was just like, what is going on here? And then of course they bring him back. There's the H two O, which is not great. Which, and, but I saw with you guys drink drink. <laughs> But then they bring it back with the most recent revival. The first one's quite good. The second one, eh, the third one, people are not loving. Um, but um, in terms of a franchise, it is the number one grossing horror franchise of all time. That's, that's, that is a fact. It is number one. Friday the 13th is number two. That doesn't make it the best. It means it's the highest grossing. But I think it's also highly influential to the genre But I think Loving Dead has the cult element to it, whereas Halloween has a mainstream level of adoption that, for me, gives it the edge. It has the iconography with Michael Myers. Living Dead lacks the iconography. And for whatever, whether it's right or wrong, that is part of my personal rubric. So I think that gives us a deadlock, two for Halloween, two for Living Dead. Halloween is a good seed. I know. Boo. Boo Boo. is just applause from ghosts. That's, that's right. Um, What happened to Josh Harnett? What happened to Josh (laughs) Harnett? First it was the son and then we never fucking saw him again. And then Judy, what's her face becomes the daughter. It's not, there's no continuity. There is no continuity. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. Judy Greer. Yeah. (laughs) She's been in everything else. Where did she come from? (laughs) Can I just Um, say for the record, because we didn't really get to talk about Halloween, that Halloween, I only have one viral video in everything I've ever posted on social media. It has over two and a half million views. And it is because... At my wedding to my husband, my nephew, who's four and a half, who's obsessed with Michael Myers. That was you? That was me. That's me out of drag, getting married, my nephew dressed as Michael Myers, and the world went crazy. It's the only viral video I have. And I feel like, and and my, people go, how the F do you let your nephew watch Halloween? It's like, he hasn't seen Halloween. He just sees Michael Myers everywhere because mm-hmm. Michael Myers is the boogeyman. He's the boogeyman. He per- permeates everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I am very sorry, Kelly. I'm very sorry. But uh, by tiebreaker rules, Halloween does advance to the final four. Um, but the good news is we have more dead. Here's Evil Dead, or mm. one seed, versus The Conjuring Universe, a two mm. seed. I'm going to start with Kelly. Which one are you on? Where are you on this one? Conjuring. <laughs> uh, Kate, where are you on this one? I am Evil Dead on this one. Peaches, where are you? Evil Dead. I'm on Conjuring with Kelly on this one. Oh I think as a franchise it has a cinematic universe to it which we have not seen anywhere else in horror evil dead is amazing and it's constantly reinventing itself and it's done very well over its 40 year but history conjuring doesn't have a dilf it doesn't have a dilf patrick wilson doesn't count he's practically a Kendall. He is sexy but he is no bruce campbell does no. not have that chin he does no, not have that chin that y'all not trying to fuck patrick Wait a minute, wait a minute. Y'all not trying to fuck him? <laughs> no, not, like, 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 if I, like, not if it's next to Bruce Campbell. I mean, it would y'all not. Are, uh, y'all are unserious fucking people. Y'all are unserious. 
<laughs> if that um, man were to knock on your door right now with a pizza of with course. no clothes on, oh my god, I'm I mean, a whore. Of course, him. Pizza. Of course yeah. I would. Oh my god, Patrick Wilson pizza. is one of the most attractive men on the face of the planet. Oh, like I handsome. look at him. He is handsome. I'm not denying that. I just, he, to me, there's nothing about him that I think is sexual. The way that Bruce Campbell has that raw kind of. <laughs> Listeners, I wish you could see nasty. Kelly. Exactly. Yes, Kelly. Raw. Is amazing. Me, like, what amazing. Is, uh, but just that the words said, Bruce Campbell and raw in yes. the same sentence. I'm wet. Right? We've done it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, I'm drier. I'm drier than a Sahara. I don't even know what the <laughs> fuck you guys are talking about right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have two for Evil Dead, two for li- for Conjuring, right? And Evil Dead's the one seed, and Conjuring is the two seed. So Evil Dead would continue there. Kelly, are you going to walk off this podcast? All the cute men are gone. Who well, is- oh, you, oh, Bruce is left. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, so is Jason Voorhees. He's a strapping young man. So on that one, it, the last one in our lead eight is Texas Chainsaw Massacre, a five seed versus Friday the 13th, the two seed. We have not talked about Friday the 13th mm. yet. Peaches, where are you voting on this one? Oh my God, this is really crazy because we haven't talked about it. And no? I have been, it feels like all night long, I've been um, defending and, and debating for Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But in a, a crazy uh, it's not a switch because the, the two haven't been put up against each other. I right. just think the magic of Crystal Lake and the woods and Jason Voorhees and mm-hmm. that first film, Betsy Palmer as his mother and, and, and everything since, including I, I thought the Freddy versus Jason thing was fun. I even liked it when Jason went to Manhattan. I liked mm-hmm. it when Jason went into outer space. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm going to go with Friday the 13th. I just want to find Jason's travel agent because yeah. they must have gotten some great deals. Um, Kelly, where are you? What was the other one? It's Texas Chainsaw, which I know you love. <laughs> and Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th. Why not? Yes. Uh, Kate Reculia. Uh, I am also Friday the 13th. I did not see this until much later in life. And like, I kid you not, the first, when I watched the first movie, I was like, oh, I want to go to camp. Like even like through all of it, it's just like, it's so beautiful. And you're like, that's so lovely and secluded. And also Ginny is a great final girl in number two. Like she's just. Oh, the best. That's number two. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also no other franchise in this list has Crispin Glover in it. So. Okay. Great point. Kevin Bacon. Yep. Meg Ryan, right? Meg Ryan was in that? No. No, no. Holly Hunter. Holly, I think Holly Hunter's in one of them. Yeah, right? Yeah, anyway. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, I think that's I a clean know. sweep for Friday the 13th, which gets us to our final four. We're going to take another quick break to visit the local asylum for the criminally insane. We will be right back after these messages. And we are back with the final four of our best horror franchise debate. At this point, I always like to take a step back and look at what we've got. We have one seed Nightmare on Elm Street, one seed Halloween, one seed Evil Dead, and two seed Friday the 13th. I forget what the other alien was the other one seed. Mm. Um, so I know Kelly is is unhappy about these seeds. <laughs> uh, uh, Peaches, you were saying that the, it makes sense to you. I just think as, a, as someone who's, you know, obviously like uh, living in the world of horror, that this... As much as I think that I could argue that other things deserve to be here, I'm not surprised that this is the final four. Kate? I mean, I did have, like, uh, Living Dead going all the way, so that is the correct answer in my heart and also in reality. But this does make sense. And also, I mean, it's about franchise, right? So it is going to kind of be a law of averages sort of final four. Yeah, that makes sense. And Kelly, are you in agreement with Kate? Like, it doesn't matter what we say the answer is. <laughs> the correct answer is Living Dead and everything else I is mean- just Dakota. I mean, this is all just bullshit, but it's like, whatever. Like, I'm here. (laughs) With that being said, let's go to these votes. (laughs) Uh, First up, it's Nightmare on Elm Street and Halloween. They are both one seeds. So I want to start with Kate. Where are you? So two icons who I don't think actually have fought each other, correct? Not Mm -hmm. on screen, but on video games they have. Okay. Um, I like... Michael's theme song better, but I the the Friday or the Nightmare on Elm Street movies are absolute genius. They're just so weird and eighties and creative and effing terrifying. All right, Kelly, where are you? It's Nightmare on Elm Street versus Halloween. Fright Night. <laughs> also a great movie. <laughs> great movie, <laughs> which we didn't talk about, which was on there. Um, yeah, well, yeah. God damn it. Um, Peaches, her turn. I don't know. 
I'm actually going to, you know, as much as I, I discussed earlier, and I can't remember if it was on the, the first version or the second time we talked, but like, uh, I'm a lifelong Freddy fan, and I did feel betrayed by that franchise overall. But at the end of the day, I think that A Nightmare on Elm Street did did more interesting things as a franchise. And the fact that it, it built an entire company up where New Line Cinema, you know, made Lord of the Rings because of Freddy Krueger. Like, so I'm... It, I'm going to vote for Nightmare on Elm Street. It's just, just, it's in my heart. Okay. Kelly, have you made a decision? I feel like Halloween is the best answer, but I feel like that's not where my heart is because Mm -hmm. I really didn't care for the last two films. And Mm -hmm. I just, Mm -hmm. whatever. I was just like, how did he come? And y'all didn't see him killing all those people across the street. And y'all are just sitting there breathing. And then she goes inside and he kills. What the fuck? It didn't make sense. But I will say (laughs) it's, uh, it's iconic. It is one of my favorite franchises, but I think there's something super special about uh, about Freddy that I can't Mm -hmm. shake. And I don't know what that is. And I'm hoping that it'll come back and be stronger and funnier and and than ever. So I'm going to say Freddy. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I think that um, the point that we were making that Halloween was kind of like the progenitor of modern slashers, um, it walked so that Freddy could stalk. Um, It it improved (laughs) upon the formula in just about every way. And um, you need to write for Drag Race. (laughs) Listen, (laughs) give me the money, give me the phone number, sweetheart. (laughs) Um, But like in terms of uh, like, it's had some bummer years, right? It's had some bad, fr- it's had a, yeah. a bad reboot. It had a, a couple really off sequels towards the end of the run. Um, but there's still so much fertile soil there, more so than I think that we got with uh, Halloween, because even Halloween rebooted itself at least two times in, in its history. Mm-hmm. Freddy's done that once. Um, and I think if they take another crack at it, they it can be spectacular. We've seen that. We've seen it be spectacular. It started out that way. So I believe that's a full sweep for Nightmare on Elm Street going to the final two. Next, mm-hmm. it's Evil Dead versus Friday the 13th. I'd like to start mm-hmm. with Kelly. Where are you? Evil Dead, Friday the 13th. I mean, I didn't even care about Evil Dead until fucking last week. It's up against what, Friday the 13th? Friday the 13th. Jason? Jason? Uh, I Kate. know. I just... Yeah, I don't no, know. it's good. This is good. This is this is exactly what we're doing. This is how it always happens. Kate? I am going with Evil Dead, uh, despite the fact that I do think there are many excellent films in the Friday the 13th, Friday the 13th franchise. Um, I the, the joy of watching Sam Raimi become a filmmaker is part of what's really special about Evil Dead. So I'm going with that. Peaches. Uh, well, I love, 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 love Evil Dead. I've defended it so much on this show tonight. I absolutely love Bruce Campbell and what it's done, I, I, you know, for for the genre. But I just can't get over Friday the 13th. I Sorry, think that Friday name. the 13th, no, that Harry Manfredini score yep. is iconic. It's genius. There, there's something, I, 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 yeah, I think it might be hilarious that if it if it's Freddy versus Jason in the end, how funny! <laughs> well, <laughs> but I'm voting for Freddy the Thirteenth. <laughs> yeah, spoiler: it's going to be Freddy versus Jason in the finale. Um, because yeah, um, I think Evil Dead is a lovely third alternate. Um, but in terms of iconography, Friday Agreed. the Thirteenth has it. It um, it's not just the fact that it has four thousand versions of that movie, and that Jason has been everywhere, Earth. The moon, the uh, I don't know, Pacoima. <laughs> you believe um, it? Jason was right? on Earth. Shocking. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's, yeah, I, I think it's just, um, it works. It's your meat and potatoes slasher movie, but God damn it, a hockey mask, a machete, and a big burly man busting through your cabin to kill some poor kids having sex. It's satisfying. <laughs> I got to tell you, you know, where's my sig? So that is it. We have a final two of Oof. Freddy versus Jason, Friday the 13th LOL. versus Nightmare on Elm Street. We're going to go around the horn. Kelly, where are you on this one? Man, I really underestimated everything about my life. Uh, in this bracket. <laughs> As I always say, you will never make a less important decision than the one you are making right now. <laughs> but it feels so fucking stressful. Like what? Okay, so wait. It's I Freddy. Think it's very wait. important. It's really Freddy and Jason. Like it this really is. is. It's literally Freddy. Friday the Thirteenth versus Nightmare on Elm Street. This is very cliche. I just have to. Yes, say. it is. It's um, very, it, it, there are no surprises. <laughs> so, looking at everything that we talked about and just the fact that Freddie has like 
he has like a TV show. He's got like a rap song. He has all this, like you can still hum that. I was watching fucking Legendary on Max and they did a whole mm-hmm. thing for Halloween where House of uh, Juicy had like the best Freddy thing. It's iconic. It's whatever. This shit is scary. That black girl got her face sucked the hell out in those glasses. I'm going for Freddy. <laughs> all right. Uh, Kate, where are you? I gotta go for Freddy. Nothing scared me more. Nothing made me more afraid of horror movies as a child than the I just the concept of Freddy Krueger. Mm-hmm. And then when I saw the movies, I, they're just they're jo- they're gleeful pieces of cinema, um, and and tactile and strange in a way I think they only could have existed in the eighties. Yeah. Um, you know, if they made those in the early aughts, they would have, they would look like digital soup now. Right. Yeah. Like, so, uh, I'm going to go, I'm going to vote for, uh, Freddie. All right. Peach is Christ. Uh, I don't think this is going to be any surprise, but I too am voting for Freddie. What puts it over the edge for me is new nightmare. I think where Wes Craven pre-scream made a movie mm. about the people making the movie. And brought Freddy Krueger into the real world where Heather Langenkamp and Robert England were playing themselves and Wes Craven showed up in the movie. That's where I'm like, it's, it's Freddy all the way. Freddy, Freddy's led the charge, you know, for so much. Um, And I love me some Jason and Crystal Lake and Harry Manfredini. Don't get me wrong, but. I think Freddy just sweeps. Yeah, uh, I'll make it a clean sweep. Ooh. And I will say I saw the original Nightmare on Elm Street when I was five. When a That's babysitter made the very bad decision to show that to my uh, my older brother. <laughs> Brian, okay. Brian vomited. I did not. <laughs> Yep, and neither one of us slept that night because that's how powerful Freddy is as a totem, why I refuse to fall asleep. So, no, it is an incredibly potent piece of cinema, and as a franchise, it's had its ups and downs, but there is still incredible possibility there, more so than I think any other horror one. So, there you have it, folks. Our pick for the best horror franchise is A Nightmare on Elm Street. Do you agree? Do you think zombies ate our brains? Tell us how you really feel by leaving a comment on this episode at greatpopculturedebate.com or find us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or Mastodon. While you're there, make sure you subscribe and follow the podcast so you can hear about what new debates are coming soon vote in open polls and even decide which topics we tackle next if you really enjoyed this episode please take a minute and to like and rate the episode of the podcast on apple spotify or whatever platform you listen on i want to say thank you to my panel if this is hell who could want to go to heaven and thank you for listening if you loved what you heard please consider supporting us on patreon where you can get even more exclusive content and you get episodes a whole day early we hope you have a good one and remember everyone is entitled to their wrong opinion brains.